Listen to a conversation between a student and a facilities manager at the university. Hi, I'm Melanie, the one who's been calling from the singing group, right? From the choir. Right, the choir. It's nice to finally meet you in person. So, you're having problems with noise. Like I explained on the phone, we've always had our rehearsals in the Lincoln Auditorium every day at three o'clock, and it's always worked just great. But the past few weeks, with the noise, it's been a total nightmare since construction started next door on the science hall. Oh, that's right. They're building that addition for new laboratories. Exactly. Anyway, ever since they started working on it, it's been so noisy we can barely hear ourselves think. Let alone sing. Forget about singing. I mean, we keep the windows down and everything, but once those bulldozers get going, I mean, those machines are loud. We've already had to cut short two rehearsals, and we've got a concert in six weeks. Well, that's not good. I'm assuming you've tried to reschedule your rehearsals. They don't do construction work at night. I ran that by the group, but there were just too many. I mean, evenings are really hard. It seems like everyone in the choir already has plans, and some even have classes at night. And what about the music building? You know, originally we were booked in one of the rehearsal rooms in the music building, but then we switched with the jazz ensemble. They're a much smaller group, and they said the acoustics, the sound in that room, was better for them. So having us move to a bigger space like the Lincoln Auditorium seemed like a reasonable idea. But now, all that noise. I don't know. I just wonder if the jazz ensemble knew what was going to happen. Well, that wouldn't be very nice. No, but it really was quite a coincidence. Anyway, now the music building's fully booked. Mornings, afternoons, everything. We just need a quiet space, and it has to have a piano. A piano? Of course,、uh, some of the other auditoriums have pianos, but that's not going to be easy. You think they're pretty booked up? Probably, but it can't hurt to check. What about Bradford Hall? I, I remember a piano in the old student center there. At this point, we'd be grateful for any quiet place. Can you? How flexible can you be on times? You said no evenings, but what if I can't find something open at three o'clock? Can you move earlier or later? I wish I could say another time would be okay, but you know how it is. Everybody's already got commitments for the whole semester. Two thirty or three thirty would probably be okay, but I don't think we could go much outside that. Well, check with me tomorrow morning. I should have found something by then. It might not be ideal. As long as it's got a piano and nobody's putting up a building next door, we'll be happy. What does the woman want the man to do? What problem concerning Lincoln Auditorium is mentioned? What does the woman imply about having rehearsals in the evening? What is the woman's attitude toward the jazz ensemble? Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the question. Can you? How flexible can you be on times? You said no evenings, but what if I can't find something open at three o'clock? Can you move earlier or later? I wish I could say another time would be okay, but you know how it is. What does the woman imply when she says this? I wish I could say another time would be okay, but you know how it is.
Listen to part of a lecture in a geology class. Now, there are some pretty interesting caves in parts of the western United States, uh, especially in national parks. There's one park that has over a hundred caves, including some of the largest ones in the world. One of the more interesting ones is called Lechuguia Cave. Lechuguia has been explored a lot in recent decades. It's a pretty exciting place, I think. It was mentioned only briefly in your books. So, can anyone remember what it said? Uh, Ellen? It's the deepest limestone cave in the U.S.? That's right. It's one of the longest and deepest limestone caves, not just in the country, but in the world. Now, what else? Well, it was formed because of sulfuric acid, right? That's it. Yeah, uh, what happens is you have deep underground oil deposits, and there are bacteria. Here, let me draw a diagram. Part of the limestone rock layer is permeated by water from below. Those curly lines are supposed to be cracks in the rock. Below the water table and rock is oil. Bacteria feed on this oil and release hydrogen sulfide gas. This gas, this hydrogen sulfide, rises up and mixes with oxygen in the underground water that sits in the cracks and fissures in the limestone. And when hydrogen sulfide reacts with the oxygen in the water, the result of that is sulfuric acid. Okay? Sulfuric acid eats away at limestone very aggressively. So you get bigger cracks and then passageways being formed along the openings in the rock. And it's all underground. Uh, yes, Paul? So that water, it's not flowing, right? It's still? Yes. So there's two kinds of limestone caves. In about 90% of them, you have water from the surface, streams, waterfall, or whatever. Moving water that flows through cracks found in the limestone. It's the moving water itself that wears away at the rock and makes passageways. Also, in surface water, there's a weak acid, carbonic acid. Not sulfuric acid, but carbonic acid that helps dissolve the rock. With a little help from this carbonic acid, moving water forms most of the world's limestone caves. When I was researching this for a study a few years ago, I visited a couple of these typical limestone caves. And they were all very wet, you know, from streams and rivers. This flowing water carved out the caves and the structures inside them. But not Lechuguia? Dry as a bone. Well, that might be a bit of an exaggeration, but it's, it's safe to say that it's sulfuric acid and not moving water that formed Lechuguia Cave and those few other ones like it. In fact, there's no evidence that flowing water has ever gone in or out of the cave. So it's like a maze. You have passageways all around. There are wide passages, narrow ones, at all different depths, like underground tunnels in the limestone. And since they were created underground, and not from flowing surface water, not all of these passageways have an opening to the outside world. And, and there's other evidence that flowing water wasn't involved in Lechuguia. We've said that sulfuric acid dissolves limestone, right? And forms the passageways? What else does sulfuric acid do? Paul? Uh, it leaves a chemical residue. Um... Gypsum, right? Yep. You'll find lots of gypsum deposited at Lechuguia. And as we know, gypsum is soluble in water. So if there were flowing water in the cave, it would dissolve the gypsum. This is part of what led us to the realization that Lechuguia is in that small group of waterless caves. And Lechuguia is pretty much dormant now. It's not really forming anymore. But there's other ones like it, for example, in Mexico, that are forming. And when cave researchers go to explore them, they see and smell the sulfuric acid and gases at work. Whew, now, it's something else. Think of rotten eggs. And... It's not just the smell. Explorers even need to wear special masks to protect themselves from the gases in these caves. Okay, uh, Paul? Yeah, how about what these caves look like on the inside? 
Oh, well, the formations are really something. Um, there's such variety there, like nothing anywhere else in the world. Some of them are elaborate-looking, like decorations, and a lot of them are made of gypsum and can be up to 20 feet long. It's pretty impressive. What is the main purpose of the lecture? The professor mentions parts of the process involved in the formation of Lechugia Cave. Indicate which of the statements below describe part of the process. According to the professor, what substance found in... What does the presence of gypsum in Lechugia Cave indicate? What can be inferred from the fact that Lechugia Cave is no longer forming? What does the professor mean when he says this? Dry as a bone. Well, that might be a bit of an exaggeration, but it's, it's safe to say that it's sulfuric acid and not moving water that formed Lechugia Cave. Listen to a conversation between a professor and a student. Jeff, I'm glad you dropped by. I've been meaning to congratulate you on the Class Leadership Award. Thanks, Professor Bronson. I was really happy to get it, and a little surprised. I mean, there were so many other people nominated. Well, I know the award was well-deserved. Now, what can I do for you today? I needed to talk to you about the medieval history test. You know, the one scheduled for Friday afternoon? Yes. Well, there's this trip that my French class is taking. We're going to Montreal for the weekend. Montreal? That's my favorite city. What will you be seeing there? Uh, I'm not sure yet. Well, the reason, the main reason I wanted to go is that we'll be rooming with French-speaking students there. You know, so we can get a chance to use our French to actually talk with real French speakers. It sounds like a great opportunity, but... 
Then there's that test. Yeah, but well, the thing is, the bus leaves right in the middle of when our history class meets this Friday. So, well, I was thinking maybe I could take the test on a different day, like Monday morning during your office hours. Ah,、uh, Monday morning. Hmm, that would not be. Oh wait, let me just see one thing. Aha. Okay, that's what I thought. So for your class, I was planning a take-home exam. So you could just take the test along with you.、Uh, let's see. I guess you could come to class Friday just to pick up the test. That way, you'd still make your bus, and then find some quiet time during your trip to complete it. And you can bring it to class Wednesday when I'll be collecting everyone else's. Hmm. Um, during the trip, well, I guess I could. So I should plan to take my books and stuff with me. You'll definitely need your class notes. I'm giving you several short essay questions to make you think critically about the points we've discussed in class. To state,、uh, state and defend your opinion, analyze the issues, speculate about how things might have turned out differently. So you see, I don't care if you look up dates and that kind of thing. What I want is for you to synthesize information, to reflect back on what we've read and discussed, and to form your own ideas, not just repeat points from the textbook. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. You're looking for my point of view. That's right. The midterm exam showed me that you know all the details of who, where, and when. For this test, I want to see how you can put it all together to show some original thinking. That sounds pretty challenging. Especially trying to work it into this trip, but yeah, I think I can do it. I'm sure you can. Thank you, Professor Bronson. Have a great time in Montreal. Why does the student go to see the professor? Why does the professor congratulate the student? What will the student do this weekend? What are two of the criteria the professor will use to evaluate students' essays? Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the question. Ah,、uh, Monday morning. Hmm, that would not be. Oh wait, let me just see one thing. Aha. Okay, that's what I thought. So for your class, I was planning a take-home exam. What does the professor imply when she says this? Monday morning. Hmm, that would not be. Oh wait, let me just see one thing. Listen to part of a lecture in a biology class. Okay, let's continue our discussion about animal behavior by talking about decisions that animals face, complex ones. Animals, even insects, carry out what look like very complex decision-making processes. The question is how. 
I mean, no one really thinks that, say, a bee goes through weighing the pros and cons of pollinating this flower or that flower. But then, how do animals solve complex questions? Questions that seem to require decision making. The answer we'll propose, of course, is that their behavior is largely a matter of natural selection. As an example, let's look at foraging behavior among beavers. Beavers eat plants, mostly trees, and they also use trees and tree branches to construct their homes in streams and lakes. So when they do forage for food and for shelter materials, they have to leave their homes and go up on land where their main predators are. So there are a number of choices that have to be made about foraging. So, for example,、um, they need to decide what kind of tree they should cut down. Some trees have higher nutritional value than others, and some are better for building material, and some are good for both.、Um, aspen trees. Beavers peel off the bark to eat, and they also use the branches for building their shelters. So aspens do double duty. But ash trees. Beavers use ash trees only for construction. Another decision is when to forage for food. Should they go out during the daytime when it's hotter outside and they have to expend more energy, or at night when the weather's cooler but predators are more active? Okay, but there are two more important issues. Really, the most central, the most、uh, important. Okay, first. Let's say a beaver could get the same amount of wood from a single large tree, one that has lots of branches, as it could get from three small trees. Which should it choose? If it chooses one large tree, it'll have to carry that large piece of wood back home. And lugging a big piece of wood forty or fifty yards is hard work; takes a lot of energy. Of course, it'll have to make only one trip to get the wood back to the water. On the other hand. If it goes for three small trees instead, it'll take less energy per tree to get the wood back home, but it'll have to make three trips back and forth for the three trees. And presumably, the more often it wanders from home, the more it's likely to be exposed to predators. So, which is better, a single large tree or three small trees? Another critical issue, and it's related to the first, to, to the size issue, is. How far from the water should it go to get trees? Should it be willing to travel a greater distance for a large tree, since it'll get so much wood from it? Beavers certainly go farther from the water to get an aspen tree than for an ash tree. That reflects their relative values. But what about size? Will it travel farther for a larger tree than it will for a smaller tree? Now. I would have thought the bigger the tree, the farther the beaver would be willing to travel for it. That'd make sense, right? If you're going to travel far, make the trip worth it by bringing back the most wood possible. But actually, the opposite is true. Beavers will cut down only large trees that are close to the water. They'll travel far only to cut down certain small trees that they can cut down quickly and drag back home quickly. Generally. The farther they go from the water, the smaller the tree they'll cut down. They're willing to make more trips to haul back less wood, which carries a greater risk of being exposed to predators. So it looks as though beavers are less interested in minimizing their exposure to predators and more interested in saving energy when foraging for wood, which may also explain why beavers forage primarily during the evenings. Okay. So why does their behavior indicate more of a concern with how much energy they expend than with being exposed to predators? No one believes a beaver consciously weighs the pros and cons of each of these elements. The answer that some give is that their behavior has evolved over time. It's been shaped by constraints over vast stretches of time. All of which comes down to the fact that the best foraging strategy for beavers isn't the one that yields the most food or wood; it's the one that results in the most descendants, the most offspring. So let's discuss how this idea works. What is the lecture mainly about?
What difference between aspen trees and ash trees does the professor point out? What does the professor identify as the two central issues involved in beavers' foraging behavior? What does the professor say about the cutting down of large trees? According to the professor, why do beavers generally forage at night? Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. Now, I would have thought the bigger the tree, the farther the beaver would be willing to travel for it. That would make sense, right? If you're going to travel far, make the trip worth it by bringing back the most wood possible. Why does the professor say this? If you're going to travel far, make the trip worth it by bringing back the most wood possible. Listen to part of a lecture in an art history class. Okay, now, um, a, a sort of paradigmatic art form of the Middle Ages was stained glass art. Stained glass, of course, is simply glass that has been colored and uh, cut into pieces and reassembled to form a picture or, or decorative design. To truly experience the beauty of this decorative glass, you, you should see it with light passing through it, um, especially sunlight, which is why stained glass is usually used for windows. But, of course, it has other uses, especially nowadays. Um, anyway, the art of making stained glass windows developed in Europe um, during the Middle Ages and was closely related to church building. In the uh, early 1100s, uh, a church building method was developed that reduced the stress on the walls so more space could be used for window openings, allowing for large and, and quite elaborate window designs. Uh, back then, the artists made their own glass, but first they came up with a design. Uh, paper was scarce and expensive, so, so typically they drew the design onto uh, a white tabletop. 
they draw the principal outline, but also outline the shape of each piece of glass to be used and uh, indicate its color. Now, in the window itself, the pieces of glass would be held together by strips of lead. So, um, so in the drawing, the uh, artist would also indicate the location of the lead strips. Uh, then you could put a, a big piece of glass on the tabletop and and see the design right through it and use it to uh, to guide the cutting of the glass into smaller pieces. And the lead that was just to hold the pieces of glass together. Well, um, lead is strong and and flexible, so it's ideal for joining pieces of glass cut in different shapes and sizes. Uh, but up to the 15th century, the um, the lead strips also helped create the design. They were worked into the window as as part of the composition. Um, they were used to outline figures to to show boundaries, just like you might use solid lines in a pencil drawing. How did they get the color? I mean, how did they color the glass? Well, up until the 16th century, uh, stained glass was colored during the glass making process itself. Uh, you got specific colors by adding metallic compounds to the other glass making ingredients. So, uh, if you wanted red, you you added copper. If if you wanted green, you added iron. You just added these compounds to the other ingredients that the glass was made of. So each piece of glass is just one color. Yes, um, at least up until the 16th century. Uh, then they started. Um, you started to get painted glass. Uh, painted glass windows are still referred to as stained glass, but the colors were actually painted directly onto clear glass after the glass was made. So um, with this kind of stained glass, you could uh, paint a piece of glass with more than one color. And with painted glass, they still use the lead strips. Yes, uh, with really large windows, it took more than one piece of glass, so you still needed lead strips to hold the pieces together. But the painters actually tried to hide them, so it was different from before when the lead strips were part of the design and. And it's different because with painted glass, the idea of light coming through to create the uh, the magical effect wasn't the focus anymore. The paintwork was, and painted glass windows became very popular. In the 19th century, people started using them in private houses and and public buildings. Unfortunately, many of the original stained glass windows. Were thought to be old-fashioned, and and they were actually destroyed, replaced by painted glass. They actually broke them. That showed good judgment, real foresight, didn't it? <laughs> yes, if only they had known.、Um, and it's not just that old stained glass is really valuable today. We lost possibly great artwork. Uh, but luckily, there was a revival of the early techniques in the mid 1800s, and and artists went back to creating colored glass and using the lead strips in their designs. The effects are are much more beautiful. In the 19th century,、uh, Louis Tiffany came up with methods to create beautiful effects、uh, without having to paint the glass. He layered. Pieces of glass and used thin copper strips instead of lead, which let him make these these really intricate flowery designs for stained glass, which he used in in lampshades. You've heard of Tiffany lampshades, right? These, of course, took advantage of the new innovation of electric lighting.、E、electric light bulbs don't give quite the same effect as sunlight streaming through stained glass, but it's close. So、uh, layered glass, Tiffany glass, became very popular and still is today. So、um, let's look at some examples of different types of stained glass from each era. What is the lecture mainly about?
What are two points the professor makes about stained glass windows made during the Middle Ages? During the Middle Ages, what was one of the first steps that artists used in making a stained glass window? According to the professor, what are two ways in which stained glass windows made in the 16th century differed from those made in earlier centuries? What does the professor imply contributed to the popularity of Tiffany glass? Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. And painted glass windows became very popular. In the 19th century, people started using them in private houses and, and public buildings. Unfortunately, many of the original stained glass windows were thought to be old-fashioned, and, and they were actually destroyed, replaced by painted glass. They actually broke them? That showed good judgment, real foresight, didn't it? What does the woman imply when she says this? That showed good judgment, real foresight, didn't it? 